I was trying to come up with a really clever opening for today's video, looking at Genesis chapters two and three and the fall. And to tell you the truth, I really couldn't come up with a clever one. So we're just gonna go with a straight introduction. If you're new to this channel, you're watching the Caffeinated Bible. The goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching in seminaries and bring it to you on YouTube, wherever you are in the world. So if you find these videos useful and you like them, please give it a big thumbs up. That helps move these videos up within YouTube's search rankings and also subscribe to the channel. Let's grab a cup of coffee and dive into Genesis chapter two, verses 15 through the end of chapter three and look at the story of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. Now what's interesting to note is how little Adam and Eve play in the rest of the Old Testament. For a story that develops such a rich tradition of interpretation later on, it's surprising how sparsely they are mentioned in the Hebrew scriptures. Last week, we looked at verses 2, 15 through 17, where God places man in the garden to care for and to maintain it. At that end of the section, we're introduced to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, from which man is commanded not to eat, for in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. Now, up until this point, everything in creation has been good. In Genesis 1, each and every day and all the aspects of creation are pronounced good or very good by God. But now we have the idea of disobedience and death being introduced into the story. If this were a silent movie, you can imagine the organist going heavy on the keys right now. This particular text also raises questions that have been raised throughout the history of interpretation. Why did God put this tree in the garden? Why did he prohibit man from eating from it? And why didn't he protect it like he protects the garden with the cherub at the end of chapter three to prevent man from coming back into the garden? Oftentimes, interpreters will try and smooth this over by arguing that God is presenting humanity with a choice to obey him or not, or an aspect of free will. But it really kind of papers over a very, very interesting aspect of this text that makes us think it provokes our thought. Now papering over it, what they do is they remove the problem or the sticking point in the story here. They try to make it easier to swallow or they try to level it out so it's not quite so provocative. By placing this tree in the garden, and remember all the trees are good to look at and to eat from, it reminds me of the challenge where parents place candy in front of their very small children, and then they tell them not to eat any of it until they get back in the room. They have a camera set up so that they can see what's going on when they're out of the room. The drama these little children go through is absolutely amazing. They touch it, then you see them remember that they're not to eat any of it but it's right there. And then they touch it again and they push it away or they eat from. And other kids, as soon as they leave the room, boy, their hand is in that candy and eating it. And I'll include the link to that candy challenge right here under this video. It's great fun to watch. This text presents us with big questions that it doesn't answer, but requires us to think about. It sets up the tragic consequences in the story as well. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil bookends the temptation story. It's right here at the start, and this is what's going to cause the fall of man. By doing so, it creates a sharp contrast between the start, where there is just Adam, or Adam, caring for and maintaining the garden, and the conclusion where Adam, Eve, and the serpent are all judged by God. Precisely what this tree signifies is almost impossible to determine. The knowledge of good and evil is so ambiguous that it could really cover a wide gamut of ideas. And it's only mentioned here and has no other close parallels in other ancient Near Eastern literature. But I think it's safe to say that this tree raises questions concerning humanity's role in the world, what we are allowed to do, what we should not do, and the punishment, especially in relationship to God. In 2.18, the text tells us, that God said it is not good for man to be alone. If the previous verse introduced a note of tension within the story, this verse develops it. 
This is the first time that the idea that something is not good is mentioned in relationship to God and creation. In chapter one, everything that God creates is good or very good. Now something is a mess with creation. Something is not good. So God sets about to meet the needs of man by creating the animals and the birds. In chapter one, the animals were created first and then man. In this story, the focus is changed and man is created first and then the animals. By doing so, it draws attention to humanity's needs. God's accommodation to humanity's need and how the human bond is different from our relationship to the rest of the creation is what's really being profiled within this story. After having Adam name all the different animals, and Adam is really not a name, it really means man or human being, and it's taken from the same root that dirt is derived from. So Adam is really kind of, we could say the dirt one. In this passage here, he has them give names to all the different animals and then fashion Eve from Adam or Adam's side. It's interesting to note that God recognizes Adam's need, that man is alone and that this is not good. If we were to go back to chapter one and look at the creation of male and female in God's image, the focus there is primarily on reproduction and following God's actions of organizing and ordering the created world. Here, in this chapter, the focus is on relationality and companionship. It is not good for man to be alone. When God causes Adam to fall asleep and takes part of his side to make the woman, the goal here is to create an ideal helper or companion that corresponds to him. She corresponds to, or is literally in the Hebrew, that she is in front of or she is opposite him. The picture here is the two standing side by side or face to face with each other. God taking Eve out of Adam raises all sorts of questions as well. Was Adam an androgynous being, both male and female, up until that point? And then God differentiates the sexes. The Hebrew that is often translated here as rib is perhaps better understood as side or part of the side. God takes part of man's side to create or fashion Eve. And why take part of the man? Why not fashion her from the dirt like he did with Adam? Is this intended to communicate just how close the male and female relationships are? At the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, they have these beautiful statues from ancient Egypt that depict husbands and wives, often standing side to side in very beautiful uh, artworks. I think this side-by-side -side depiction brings across a little bit of what the author of Genesis is getting at here by specifically saying that God took part of man's side to make woman and that she corresponds or she is next to or she is in front of him. If we move on a little bit further down in verses 24 and 25, it says, A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. To a certain extent, this passage also provides us with an explanation for family and community, as well as the basis for marriage. From a narrative point of view, this is the center of the story. The rest of this story revolves around this. Up until now, God fashioned man, placing him in the garden, naming the animals, and then the creation of Eve or woman. After 24 and 25, the story is going to shift to the temptation and then the fall of humanity. There is also an interesting wordplay here in the words naked and they were not ashamed. Naked, harom, is a play on words with the word for crafty that is going to be used in 3.1, or arum. So they were naked, arum, but the serpent is crafty, arum. So let's turn to 3.1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other beasts of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And once again, we are presented with an ambiguity in the text. Up until now, all the animals that have been created are good. So where did this crafty snake come from? 
Now in the ancient Near East, serpents were often seen as symbols of death or wisdom, and both seem to be reflected in this story. The serpent also figures in the Epic of Gilgamesh. After Gilgamesh retrieves sort of a magical plant from the bottom of the ocean, a serpent tricks him and ends up eating the plant instead, robbing him of the possibility of eternal life. Perhaps the best way to say this is in the ancient Near East, the serpent would have been represented as an ancient archetypal figure of shrewd wisdom, perhaps maybe a trickster, as it says here in this text, that he is very crafty. Around 100 BC, the pseudepigraphal book, the Book of Wisdom, will link the serpent to the devil. In Wisdom 2.23, it says, For God created man to be immortal, and he made him to be an image of his own eternity. Verse 24, Nevertheless, through envy of the devil came death into this world. So you can see how the Book of Wisdom is making a reference to this story in the Garden of Eden, and the serpent in our story is now explicitly linked to the devil. And the Book of Wisdom is probably written around 100 BC. So you see, we have a very long historical gap between when Genesis is written and the Book of Wisdom before we have an explicit reference that this serpent in this story here is the devil. Another thing I want to point out here in this story is that if you're just looking at Genesis, man's disobedience is not so much depicted as a great act of wickedness or transgression as it is so much an act of folly. Man is deceived by the serpent. So let's pick up in chapter 3, verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. It's surprising, given how important this story is to the overall biblical narrative, just how simple yet complex it is told with great mastery and artistic skill. Notice how the serpent only speaks twice. In verse 1, did God actually say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And then in verse 4, he responds, but the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. At the center of this temptation is the knowledge of good and evil. The problem is, is that up until now, man and woman do not know what good and evil is. So how are they to know if eating from this tree is good or evil? But Eve does know the prohibition that they are not to eat from this tree, but not perfectly notice. She adds this command not to touch it. This introduces a note of confusion or misunderstanding into the account on her part. Does she truly understand the command? How did she learn it? Since she was not made when God gave the command to Adam, did Adam pass it along correctly? Or by overstating the command, he actually weakened her understanding of it. Also note the center of this crafty creature's question centers on how God knows and uses knowledge. Up until this point in time, God knows and uses his knowledge for good. In 2.18, for example, it says that he knows that it is not good for man to be alone, and so he solves that problem by creating a partner for him. Now the serpent questions what God knows and if this is good for Adam and Eve. Basically, he questions, God knows that this tree is good and that eating from it will be good for you, but God is holding back that goodness from you. In verse 6, the senses dominate. The woman sees, desires, touches, eats, and then Adam does as well also. 
Almost everything in this verse is true. In 2.9 it says that the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, along with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. So when she looks at the tree and sees that the tree is good and that it was pleasant to the eye and good for food, this is all picking up what we've already been told about the garden already in verse 9. And just as another little side note here, oftentimes the deception of Eve by the serpent is used as a basis within the church that women should be subordinate to men in marriage and in the church, or denying them particular offices or roles within the church. The problem is, is that Adam is right there by her side and is just as culpable as her. He's silent, but present. In verse 7, they eat from the fruit of the tree, and their eyes are opened. And what they see now is not the good, but their own nakedness and shame, something which until now they had not noticed. And this idea of that their eyes are being opened, their eyes were already opened. This is a metaphor based upon the simple idea that seeing is understanding. It is not so much physical seeing that is mine here, but it's understanding something that they had not perceived or understood up until this time. Genesis 3, 8 through 13. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I have commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The reference here to the cool of the day takes us back to last week's video. These royal gardens or orchards provided relief and comfort from the heat of the Middle Eastern day. And God here is pictured as a king coming into his orchard or garden, enjoying the coolness and the beauty of his royal garden. Cool of the day literally is the breeze or the wind of the day, and it may have a second meaning. The phrase can also refer to a storm coming. So instead of the cool of the day, it may speak about God coming on the wind of a storm for judgment. Zephaniah 2.2 is a passage that conveys this idea about God coming on the wind or a storm. Before God's decree becomes reality and the day of opportunity disappears, like the wind-blown chaff, before the Lord's raging anger overtakes you, if we go with this secondary meaning, that instead of God coming during the cool of the day, but he's coming on a wind or a storm, then this explains why they are terrified and they hid. In this case, they are hiding from God because of the fear of this incredible storm and God coming in judgment. Their relationship with God is now broken and they are now alienated from their creator. When God asks these questions, where are you? Who told you? Have you eaten from the tree? What is this have you done? God's question in this story will be echoed later in the story of Cain and Abel. Where is your brother Abel? What have you done? So in a certain way, you see the author setting up chapter 4 and the murder of Abel by Cain. In chapter 3, verses 14 through 20, we have what is called the judgment oracle. Just like the temptation, what is interesting here is just how little is said. For one of the most formative stories in the Bible, you would expect a great deal more to be said. Up until now, Adam and Eve have been central characters. Now they are merely passive as God delivers a judgment oracle upon them. In verse 15, we are told that the seed of the woman, he will crush the head of the serpent, your head. The woman's seed here can be understood as a reference to a, either an individual or a group in the future. It's a rather ambiguous term. The Hebrew term here translated as offspring is a collective term. It's a lot like in English when we use the word fruit. We can refer to either a single piece of fruit or a group. 
However, he will bruise has a singular pronoun and a verb. So Christian interpreters have translated this passage along the lines of, I will put an enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's the English Standard Version. But Jewish interpreters go with the collective idea of this noun, offspring. And they translate it as, I will put an enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. They shall strike at your head, and you shall strike at their heel. So you see how there's play and variability for how we understand this story. Or another way we could say is that there's enough room within it for how we interpret it that opens up sort of questions about what is this talking about and how should we interpret it. So who is the seed of the woman? Now this chapter really doesn't answer that question, but it raises it. In the book of Genesis, though, this question is going to be addressed in a number of different ways. Is it Cain, Eve's first child, or is it Seth, her third? Is it Isaac, the promised child to Abraham, or Jacob, or Joseph? All these are promised children who shape the line of the ancient nation of Israel. And some 1,500 years later, the authors of the New Testament is going to see it as a typological reference to Christ, but within the context of the book of Genesis, we would probably have to look somewhere along the lines of like Cain, Seth, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, somewhere along there. And then finally, we come to the real sticking point in this passage here in verse 16, where it says, he will rule over you. Now, this doesn't just mean lead, but to dominate. Now, those who take this as a basis for the structure of marriage miss the point here. This domination is not part of God's intended order, but is part of the curse. Alan Ross, in his commentary on Genesis that I referred to last week, I'll have a link to it in the description under this, argues, he says that male domination in the history of the human race is a perpetual reminder of the fall. If Eve is an archetype, that is, that she represents every woman, and Adam represents every man, then the story portrays a characteristic of the human nature. Woman at her worst would be a nemesis to the man, and man at his worst would dominate the woman. And so it's not a basis or a model for marriage, but rather it is part of the curse that hopefully Christ has redeemed us from. In verses 17 through 20, our relationship with creation is broken. For the man, the good land blessed by God in chapters one and two is now cursed. We can no longer freely eat from the produce of the land. It also sets up a before and after picture of the land. The present condition of the land and food is not the way God intended it to be. In verses 22 through 24, this story continues on. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Man and women were created in the image of God. However, they succumbed to the temptation to become like God, and as a result, they found themselves no longer with God. Humanity's happiness and goodness does not consist in his being like God as it does in his being with God, enjoying God's presence and his blessings. One of the features of any story that takes on the role of what we call a foundational narrative within any culture is that it possesses an excess of meaning. Successive generations of readers, when they go to that story, find facets and nuances in the story that make it relevant to them, and not just an account of what happened in the past. The story of the Garden of Eden is definitely a story that fulfills this role. It's not just a story about what happened in the past, but it's also a story that we can put ourselves within. In many ways, it's a story that happens to each and every one of us. We can see how we lose our innocence, 
how we are alienated from others in the natural world or in our relationship to God. It provides a fundamental narrative framework for us to understand our situation in the world and also project possibilities for an ideal existence in paradise. Mm -hmm.